If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to the book of Ephesians, we are beginning a new series. Uh, looking at the book of Ephesians, we're calling it Life in Christ, and that will become apparent to you today as we start uh, this uh, series. Now, as we begin this series, and especially with today's message, uh, we need to build a foundation for us to get into the, the book. So, I'm letting you know right now, you need to sit up straight, you need to pay attention, and uh, maybe you need to have your elbows ready for your partner because I need to give you a bunch of information to get us started today. Uh, and so it's going to be information side more than application side, but we'll get there with that as well. And the first thing you need to understand is that this book that we call a book, the book of Ephesians, is really an epistle. And the word epistle uh, literally means letter. So Paul is writing a letter uh, to this church or, or churches in the area here. Um, and so I want you to get that and understand that, that the, that the heart behind this is a letter that he's writing uh, uh, here. And so if you'll do this with me to kind of get us in the, the mode of what's happening in Paul's life right now, you can imagine with me uh, this morning, you are in prison. Not only are you in prison, you are on death row. You are scheduled for execution. You don't know when that's going to be, but you are on death row, and you have done absolutely nothing legally wrong. You have not broken the law in any way. You have not harmed anyone in any way. You have no reason legally to be on death row, but you're not going to renounce why you are on death row. You're not going to fight why you are there. And the reason why you'll re not renounce uh, being on death row is because you are on death row for simply being a Christ follower and sharing the message of the gospel. Those are the actual charges against you. Not that you were disorderly, not that you did anything wrong, not that there was anything else. You are a Christ follower. And you are sharing the gospel message is enough to put you into prison, but not only in prison, on death row. And as you sit in your prison, awaiting your execution, you decide to uh, abide your time, to, to do your time as you're waiting for this, you're going to write a letter, and as you get ready to write this letter, you think about what you're going to write, and you think, well, I'm going to write to other Christ followers, and as I sit here and I decide what I'm going to write, I'm going to write a letter to encourage them to follow Jesus, right? So he's in prison because he's following Jesus, and he wants to encourage other Christians to do the same. And then he wants to encourage those who are not Christ followers well, to actually become Christ followers. And then he wants to encourage uh, others who are actually believers to, well, live out their faith so that they stand out as Christians. Sound crazy? That's exactly where we find the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul is not in prison as we would understand it as he writes this letter to the Ephesians. Uh, he's actually in his home. He's in Rome. He's in his home. Uh, he is under house arrest. But being under house arrest means that he has a couple guards that are there in his home with him constantly. He can have visitors come in that he writes these letters to and they take to the churches. Uh, but he's not allowed to go anywhere. He's not allowed to do anything. And these guards are watching him all the time. Some have even suggested that Paul was chained to these guards 24 hours a day, seven days a week, if you can imagine that. Could you imagine someone being attached to each of your arms as you're trying to do stuff in your... That'd be crazy. But uh, some suggest that. Let me ask you this question as you think about it. How in the world does a Christ follower sitting on death row encourage other Christ followers to live and be excited about their faith while persuading non-believers to become Christ followers. Not a great brochure, is it? Hey, I'm in prison, <laughs> and uh, guess what? I'm going to die, but would you follow me? 
Well, here's the reason why. It's actually simple, but it's very, very profound. Because Paul understands this. This is what he wants us to understand, and this is what he's setting out at the beginning of his letter. Despite the circumstances of life. Did you hear me? Despite the circumstances of life. The blessings of being a follower of Christ greatly outweighs the persecution and even the death of the Christ follower. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, yeah, I know it doesn't look good. I know I'm going to lose my life. I know that I'm on death row, and I know why I'm here, and I'm proud to be here for the reason that I'm here. As a matter of fact, in his letter to the Romans, Paul expressed the same thoughts this way. He said in Romans chapter 8, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us. In other words, it never ever can get so bad here that it eclipses the glory of what God is doing in our lives and what we will have for all of eternity. Isn't that good? You want to know what heaven's like? Here's what it's like. It's good. It's good all the time. It's better than anything we have in this world. As a matter of fact, what Paul is saying is as much persecution, as much hatred, and even as, as bad as it can be, heaven is a million times the opposite of that and the glory that God has for us. So today we're going to explore the beginning of this letter. We're just going to get into the introduction. Uh, these are a couple verses here that, that you're like, how in the world can you preach on these verses? They don't really say a whole lot, but I've got a lot to share with you. That's how this works, right? And so uh, let's get into this. Let's read the, the first couple verses that Paul has for us as he uh, gives his greeting to uh, the church here in Ephesus. And Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I want to break down a few things to kind of give us some foundation here as to what's going on. And the first question we need to ask ourselves is, who is Paul? Who is this person that is writing this uh, letter? Many of you possibly already know who this is. Paul comes on the scene in the Scriptures in the book of Acts, at the very beginning of the book of Acts, when the Pharisees are stoning Stephen, you remember the story? Uh, Stephen preaches a message that's a little too close to home for the Pharisees, kind of steps on their toes, and they do the most sensible thing they can do. Let's kill him. And that's what they do. They get upset. Bible te Luke tells us, as uh, the author of Acts, that uh, in the stoning of Stephen, uh, the Pharisees laid their coats at the feet of a young man by the name of Saul. Now, Saul, in the book of Acts, is also the Apostle Paul that we're talking about here. Now, how many of you have ever heard this statement? Don't, don't raise your hand, just think to yourself. How many of you ever heard this? His name was Saul until he got saved and God changed his name to Paul, right? Guess what? That's absolutely wrong. Did you know that? You're like, wait a minute, heresy. No, it's not, it's not heresy, I promise you. Paul was a Jewish Roman. He was born a Jew, was a Roman citizen. His Jewish name, or the pronunciation of his name in the Jewish Hebrew language, was Saul. His Roman name, or his Gentile name, was Paul. And since Paul was called by Christ to go and minister to the Gentiles, he uses the name Paul more than he uses Saul. So the reason why he was Saul with the, with the Sanhedrin and, and, and with the Jewish leaders there is he was acting as a Jew, and so his name was Saul. But everywhere else in the Scriptures, we see him going to the Gentiles, and his name is Paul. So maybe it's more dramatic to think that God changed it after he was saved, but that's really the reality of what it was. And in, in, in Greek, um, I think it was Paulus. So in the Greek language, it was a different name. Uh, too. Just like uh, I think my name in Spanish would be Miguel, right? But instead of Michael, it'd be Miguel. So that's just how it is, okay? So after Stephen's death, Saul took up the mantle of persecuting and getting rid of this new sect called the Way, which became the church today. He was persecuting and killing those who were followers of this Jesus. And we know that while on the road to Damascus to go persecute the church, he encounters... Um, 
the risen Lord Jesus Christ and his life is radically changed. He is saved. And as a result of that, he has three missionary journeys that he goes to Gentile nations to preach the gospel. And Ephesus is one of these areas that he went. He was there in his second missionary journey, but he didn't stay there in his second missionary journey. It was his third missionary journey where he went to Ephesus. He preached the gospel, established the church, was there for three years, and had a great ministry while he was there. And then from there, he traveled another 10 years until he's now in Rome in, underneath house arrest and getting ready to be a persecute, or to be crucified, not crucified, excuse me, that was Jesus, not Paul. Are you with me? Okay. Following? Okay. Just want to make sure you're on your toes. You know where we're going with this thing here, right? He was actually beheaded uh, in his death. He was in prison waiting for his death. So let's get a little information about Ephesus now. Where was Ephesus? Ephesus was the capital city of the, Ro- uh, of the Roman province in Asia. It would be in modern Turkey today where Ephesus was. Ephesus was a huge city. It was located at the intersection of several major trade routes, which made it, brought it its prosperity and, and its growth. It is famous for the pagan temple of Diana, if you've heard of that. It was one of the uh, ancient seven wonders of the world. But Paul had a very powerful ministry in Ephesus. This is so much fun. I love this fact. Paul had such a powerful ministry in Ephesus that he was leading so many people to Christ and so many people were converting, uh, leaving the temple of Diana to become followers of Jesus Christ. Now, this is so good. I, I, want to, I wish we could have this happen today. They were so much leaving the temple of Diana that those that were making the idols, the, the craftsmen that made the idols of the temple of Diana, rioted in the streets because too many people were becoming Christians. Come on, you got to know that would be so good, wouldn't it? I mean, think about it. Well, I mean, what, you know, we don't have idol makers here, but, but could you imagine that um, the, the very few limited number of bars we have in our, in our town right now closing and those owners being mad because of the fact too many people are saved and not going to those bars any longer? Could you imagine? Can I tell you a truth? If God did it with Paul, he can do it with us. Absolutely can. And I love that. His ministry was so great that, that this, they rioted uh, and were so upset. And as a result, Ephesus became a center for great evangelistic outreach to the rest of the province of Asia. As a matter of fact, most scholars believe that when Paul wrote this letter, he wasn't writing it to one church. He was writing it for several around that area and, and the outlying areas because the gospel had grown so much in that area and become such a great center, a hub for preaching the gospel message. So as we see in our introduction here, Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus, and he tells us specifically who he's writing to. He, he's writing to saints, to the saints that are in the area there. Now, Maybe you have a question today. You say, Pastor Mike, isn't a saint a person or people that are already dead? And over time, through a uh, set of strict strict requirements, the church has deemed them as being saints? Maybe you've heard that. Maybe you've, you've thought that, that really you don't become a saint until you meet a criteria, a list of criteria, after you're dead, because there's some denominations that actually teach that. But the reality is this. The word saint simply means a follower of Jesus Christ. In other words, someone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus, someone who is saved. So Paul is writing specifically to the Christ followers, specifically to those who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And as he's writing this to the saints that are there, he gives them this greeting. And really the greeting is not an abnormal greeting or a special greeting. This is found common in the letters that Paul has written, uh, the many epistles that we have in the New Testament. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, that, that, that's just a general greeting for us. We understand the grace of God is God's unmerited favor and, he's, and peace is God's peace in our lives. And so truly what Paul is doing here would be similar to saying, Hi, how are you? It's really what it is. How are you doing? How are things going? Um, hope you are all fine. Hope things are good. And so it might come across more literally as, I hope that the grace and peace of God may 
be yours. And so we see now that Paul is writing to those believers in Ephesus. And he's writing this and addressing them. And this is just basically a classic introduction. But you know that's not all I could be preaching to you today, right? I want to take us back to one simple phrase that is so very important and foundational to this letter. And Paul uses the phrase here, uh, those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who are in Christ Jesus. This phrase, Paul uses one version or another of it 27 times in this letter, which emphasizes its importance in this text. And the phrase describes, listen now, you need to hear this, this phrase describes the spiritual position of those who have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, you are considered in Christ. That's what he's talking about. You are in Christ. You have uh, been saved, and positionally you are in Christ, which means that you receive all the blessings that are associated with this spiritual position. And it's from this point that the Apostle Paul is starting his letter, and when we go through, especially chapter number 1 uh, and chapter 2 and 3 are the doctrinal portions of the letter that he gives us, he's going to lay out in great detail what it means to be in Christ. He's going to lay out in great detail on, on what our position is, and as a result, what those tremendous blessings are for us. But I wanted to take the time this morning to define as clear as I possibly can what it means to be in Christ, or how a person becomes in Christ. Now, if you're saved today, you already know this. So I'm asking you right now, I pray and hope that this doesn't become ordinary to you. But it reminds you of what God has done for you. And if you would say, I don't know whether I'm a Christ follower or not, or I'm in Christ today, would you listen intently to the Word of God? You see, a person that is in Christ is a person that we would use the term around here is saved. Or a person who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means that all of us uh, are in the same place. We're all sinners. We're all in need of a Savior. And the reality is, is, in order for us to be saved, we need to recognize and understand that that is where we are in life. That every single one of us start off in the same point. We are sinners. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned. Do you know what the word all means? That means I are one. That's what that means, right? It means we're all in the same boat. We're all on the same level. We're all at the same place. We are all sinners. And as a result of that, we come short of God's glory. In other words, we cannot reach the holiness of God. If you want to get to heaven on your own, you can do it. I've never heard a preacher say that. Here's what you need to do. Be perfect in your thought, be perfect in your language, be perfect in your actions, be perfect in the way that you act and react to others. Is be perfect. Absol I mean, listen, that even means as an infant, you can't lie with that cry that you cry, that mean, you think you're hungry, but you're not hungry, and your, your diaper doesn't mean, you know, that, that's the evil of those babies, right? Right? They come out of the womb lying. That's what they do. Right? You have to be perfect. Guess what? Not one of us meets that standard apart from Jesus Christ. So guess what? You're in great company. We all fall short. But you also need to recognize that because we fall short, because of our sin and the sin that we choose to do in our life, that separates us from God. The Bible says in Romans 6.23 that the wages, the payment of that sin is death. The word death means separation. We understand physical death to be separated from our loved ones. But this is also spiritual death, which means that we're separated from God. If we die in the state that we're born in, we don't accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If we die in our sins, we are separated from God. That's the bad news. 
Are you ready for some good news now? That even as a sinner, even in your rebellious state against God, He loved you so much that He sent His Son to die for you. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated. He didn't just say it. He didn't just utter the words. He demonstrated. Put His love into action. He demonstrated for us. His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. Bore our sins on His body. Paid the price. Paid the payment that He did not have to pay because He didn't owe. But He paid the price for us. Died in our place. Bore our sins. That if we simply will recognize that we are a sinner, ask God to forgive us of our sin, put our faith and trust in His death, burial, and resurrection, and confess with our mouth that we are sinners and we ask the Lord Jesus to come be Lord of our life. Lord, come into my life. Save me and be Lord of my life here. That when we do that, the Bible says, God will save us. And there's never a time that God says no. But listen, has there been a time in your life, has there been a time in your life where you got serious with God? You know, it amazes me. Are you ready? It amazes me how good we are at lying to ourselves. Do you realize that we are our own worst salesmen? If you ever had a salesman say to you what you say to yourself to convince you that you're okay, you would slap the salesman. You would be offended by what they would say, but you take anything and everything to make sure that you have your excuse. I can just wait. I've got time. It doesn't really matter. I'm not as bad as he is, or I'm not as bad as she is, or I haven't done all of this. And as a matter of fact, according to everybody else, I'm a good person. It doesn't matter if you're a good person with everybody else. Are you a good person with God? And God says, I'm sorry. No, I'm perfect. You're not. You need a Savior. You need to be saved. I hope and pray today that you said, yes, I've accepted him and you will be in Christ. And the blessings that we're going to talk about in these upcoming weeks will be applied to you. And if not, I pray today, I pray today that you'll call out to the Lord the best way you know how. God, I know I'm a sinner. We all are. Forgive me. I believe. Be Lord of my life. It's as simple as it is. Putting our faith in him. But can I move to one other thing today that's really on my heart? And that is this. Church, we are living in a day and age where this must be our primary message to the world. My heart breaks today over where we have come as a people and a church since this pandemic began and where we are now. You know why? Because we'll talk about politics. We'll talk about vaccines or no vaccines or masks or no masks. We'll get on all of these different levels here, and we will divide ourselves over these things. When church, we must be united in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The world doesn't need to know about who's going to be our next president. The world doesn't need to know about what politician is doing what criminal thing or that criminal thing. The world doesn't need to know what's going on with COVID-19. The world needs Jesus. And I believe with all of my heart, all of this stuff is a ploy of the devil to distract us. Especially in the day and age that we are living. I was listening to a news report the other night from a different country. My wife was sitting there. And you know that I like to study prophecy and think about those things. And I kept, I was watching it on YouTube so I could pause it, right? I got to have control. And we would 
he would say something, and I would pause it, and I'd go, Paula, do you realize? This is real time now. This is talking about things that are happening in our world right now. Do you realize he's talking about a one-world government? What's more? Do you realize he's talking about a one-world economy? A little bit more? A little scary? Do you realize that he's making reference to this or that in the future? What the Bible says? Now, I don't know if it's all going to pan out that way, but the language that we're hearing in the world today should remind us constantly that our king is coming and we need to be ready and the world needs to be ready for his return. Which means this, church, we must get back to the gospel. We must get back to preaching the gospel. We must get back to giving the gospel. We must get back to living the gospel. We're all going to die. Last time I checked, and I I haven't checked in a while, but I'm pretty sure the death ratio is one to one still. And Paul is telling us, those of us that die outside of Jesus Christ, die and go to a place called hell, separated for eternity. Believer, that, that is the number one thing that should motivate you. That is the number one thing that should concern you. That is the number one thing that should scare you. There is nothing that man has done or will ever do that can stop God's plan. So are you in Christ? Guess what? If you're in Christ, nothing this world can do to you. As Apostle Paul said, I'm in prison. I'm going to lose my life. Guess what? I have joy. Why? Because I'm in Christ. I'm not bothered by the fact that I... And he, listen, he was underneath the most ruthless dictator of that day, Nero. Nero, who was burning Christians at the stake to light his garden. That's no joke. Look it up. Wicked. And Paul was being put to death by this man simply because he was a believer in sharing the gospel message. And we're going to worry about who's our next senator, our next governor, or even our next president? Or what pandemic is going to be next? Jesus says, you'll have trouble in this world, but guess what? I have overcome the world. Don't worry about it. Give them Jesus. Give them Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus today, you must, you must, you must. I don't know how anybody walks in this world without Jesus. Okay, I got off my notes, I'm sorry. But church, I pray this would be passionate in your heart. I like to do good. I like to be eloquent, but it doesn't matter. I just want you to have Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I want you to go to your family and give them Jesus. And I want you to go to your friends and give them Jesus. And I want you to go to your coworkers and give them Jesus. And then after all of that, I want you to go to your enemies and give them Jesus. Jesus is coming. He's commissioned us to build his kingdom. Will you go? Will you take the greatest message this world needs into the streets of this community, in the streets of your community, and in love and grace share with them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Will you stand with me in God's house today? I'm going to ask the praise team to come. Father God, I thank you so much for your love. And God, I thank you for the gospel message. And God, quite honestly, we should be excited about going out these doors and sharing this genuine truth. So Lord, as we close with this song today, with this anthem, with this excitement, oh God, we pray, we pray that you will use us to build your kingdom here.
through the souls that are one because of the work that we do for you. We ask this all in Jesus' name.